Welcome, everyone. I can't believe is this week four of our uh, extended homes tour 2022. I'm Ingrid Spencer. I'm the executive director for AIA Austin. And I want to welcome you to this session. This is about the Hillside Residence with Furman and Kyle Architects. And our moderator today is our AIA Austin president of 2023. Christy Taylor. Um, I just want to give a general shout out to our sponsors for the Homes Tour. We're incredibly grateful to all of you for supporting the tour and supporting the chapter, our underwriters and our gold sponsors of this particular house get a special thank you from all of us. So with that, I'm going to turn everything over to our moderator, Christy Taylor, to introduce our architects today. Enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, hi, my name is Christy. Um, I could not be more excited to introduce you today to Philip Kyle and Troy Miller of Furman Kyle Architects, who will be sharing some of the design processes that went into the Hillside Residence. Um, which is one of the nine fantastic homes on the upcoming AIA Austin Homes Tour. Philip joined with Gary Furman to form Furman and Kyle Architects in 2005. Uh, Troy joined the firm in 2010 and was named principal at the beginning of this year. Awesome, Troy. Um, I know that Philip and Troy have a lot of information to share today. I want to go ahead and pass it off. If during the presentation you have questions that pop into your mind, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We will kind of call through them, collect them, and get those questions out if we have any time at the end. So with that, take it away, guys. Thanks, Christy, and thanks for, uh, thanks for all your volunteer service. Excited to have you be president next year. So we're just going to dive right on into it because we've got a lot to share today. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully I'm Clicking the right button here. Let's see. I'm not sure which one. Can everybody see my screen? Are we good? All right. So um, uh, today's presentation. So this is a house that's over in Travis Heights neighborhood. Uh, Travis Heights. Just quick context. It's an old uh, neighborhood filled with bungalows, but there's a lot of new development pressures on it. Um, our clients um, came to us um, and uh, really gave us the charge. So it's, uh, our clients, Mark and Rosemary Whaling, uh, fairly typical program of an of a, of a empty nester house. Uh, they have a couple of grown kids, um, but they're also, they, they sort of dabble in development. And they wanted to have a house for themselves, but they charged for Mikhail with really uh, maximizing the, the buildable potential of this site. Uh, so uh, in a lot of ways, that's really what makes this project um, interesting to talk about because there's a ton of uh, challenges fitting what really is kind of a, a suburban scale program onto a pretty tight urban lot. Uh, so today we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of uh, City of Austin regulations and restrictions, uh, all the different forces at, at play that guided our hand in designing this. And so uh, for anybody out there that's watching that's um, uh, uh, a client, on the client side of things, uh, you may get a little bit technical. Um, we're hoping to really shed some light you know, for the architects in the group on uh, all the different uh, hoops we jump through to, to shoehorn this, uh, this house onto this tight little site. Um, so today, really, we're, we're going to get uh, technical with some, with some of those challenges, uh, zoning restrictions, a sloping site, um, you know, how do we bring daylight into it when we've got neighbors so close, and at the end, we'll kind of uh, start touching on the materiality of the house. But I would encourage you, really, if you want to see the house, just to come on by um, on the Homestead weekend, and love to, to show it off to you. Um, quick shout out to our project team. Uh, in addition to me and Troy, our colleague Drew Wilson worked on it with us. Uh, and I should also mention too, uh, Monis and Nathan in our office really helped out a lot on this presentation. Could have done that without her. Our fantastic clients, Mark and Rosemary Whaling, 
Um, we'll talk about them a little bit more in a bit. Um, we're also the builders on this. Uh, Mark uh, owns a concrete company here in town called uh, Austin Concrete Development, one of the very few firms in town that can do high-end architectural concrete. And he took on this uh, pretty large task of, of building his own home. I don't know if you uh, want to do it again, but he, he, I think that they did a fantastic job. And so shout out to them. They've been dream clients. Uh, also, our structural engineer, Sam Covey of Fort Structures, he's a sponsor, um, uh, and uh, Jose from Out, uh, Austin Outdoor Design. This is the first time we'd worked with them, and they were great collaborators. I would highly recommend working with them. And then same with Blair Burton. We had, we had not worked with her on the interiors. I think she did a, a phenomenal job. And again, great collaborators. Can't, can't recommend them enough. Um, uh, and so again, uh, I know Ingrid, show the underwriter sponsors Blair Burton and Austin Outdoor Design. Um, we also had some gold level sponsors, Presidio Doors and Windows. Um, they supplied both the steel windows and the wood windows in the house, fort structures, uh, Boomtown Design uh, were trim carpenters, but they just touched just about every surface of this house. So a lot of the credit goes to them for help create it looks. Uh, Ferguson, of course, supplying a lot of our plumbing fixtures, uh, Chris Sinek, we're seeing more and more as like the go-to wood flooring people that are on a lot of our jobs now. And then uh, the silver sponsors, Eastside Lumber and Austin Concrete Development. So again, couldn't do all this without you. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm gonna dive in into a little bit of context to this site, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Troy to really get into the, into the, um, the, the design of the house, because a lot of that really took place under design, uh, under Troy's hand. Um, this site is, and I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, this is South Congress. So we're south of the river. This is the Bolden neighborhood and then the Travis Heights neighborhood uh, on the east side of Congress, uh, south of the Colorado River. Um, and our, uh, so, you know, our, our clients uh, are, are Canadian and they fell in love with this neighborhood because it reminded them of the more dense urban neighborhood that they had um, grown fond of in Toronto that kind of couple block walk out of their front door uh, to the Continental Club and to all the shops and restaurants uh, on, on South Congress. Just love that vibe. Um, if you zoom in to the kind of the, the context around the site, one of the kind of best things the site had going for it was that it was in a, a long east-west orientation, which is probably the, the one easy thing that the site dished up. Um, I'll talk about the easy stuff. <laughs> Troy, you can talk about all the hard stuff. Uh, and then uh, immediate context, there's a, a, a large uh, two-story house on higher ground to our north. And then there's uh, one of the old historic bungalows um, that's very common throughout this neighborhood still to our south. So that kind of sets up the immediate context to this and uh, we'll jump in. Um, again, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Troy, but these are some kind of first schematic design sketches that, that we that we uh, showed our clients. Yeah, and so, you know, really sort of high level, you know, starting to get into the ideas of what is it to sort of build in Austin and what are those things that, and pressures and, and regulations that go into a, a fairly difficult lot like this. Um, you know, we had the, the east-west axis, so we could really orient it south, smaller building to the south, allowed us to, you know, uh, get more daylight from that side of the building. Um, larger house sort of uphill from us, sort of uh, shying away from that side and really making that sort of a, a more solid sort of service side of the project. All these utility areas up on the north side and open on the south. Um, and sort of going into it, doing our own research into sort of code and what was allowable, you know, given our, you know, the, the client's design wishes to have a fairly large house um, that sort of met with budgetary restraints and sort of uh, the future ability to not that they sort of view this as their forever home, but knowing how things happen that wanted a house that was was marketable um, at the end of the day and how, you know, maybe going into the lot a little bit and the difficulties of it, it's starts out sort of low on the street side, rises up quickly towards the back lot line for, you know, 18 feet of grade change, 
And, and really about 10 of that happens in the, in the front uh, third of the lot. Uh, and then it also from a, a 50 foot or 59 foot front property line narrows down to about a 28 foot property line on the back. So it's, it's you know, dramatically tapering, <laughs> tapering to the back of the lot and uh, going uphill. We started to think about some of the things that uh, sort of how do we get extra FAR? Our allowable FAR for the building on this project was uh, 2,856 feet. Uh, at the end of the day, we squeezed a lot more than that in, and we'll talk about that later. Sort of using FAR rules and where you sort of get free um, FAR for, per the sub chapter F regulations. No, I'll interject here for the people that are watching that aren't architects and kind of we're going to throw a, a lot of lingo out. FAR is one of the ones we're going to talk a lot about today and it means it stands for floor to area ratio and it's it's what the city of Austin imposes on uh, on lots to, to, uh, to tell you what the maximum amount of square footage you can build. So if the size of your lot is 10,000 square feet, let's say, and the, and the FAR is 40%, then you can, you're allowed to build 4,000 square feet. So when Troy says our maximum FAR allowed by the city was 2,800 square feet, that's what the city allows. And then we can sort of play with the rules of FAR. They have certain allowances of things that um, allow you to, to increase that. Um, and so one of the first things we thought of since this lot is sloping up in a way is can we, because anything that's considered a basement doesn't count against your FAR. So if you, you know, if you can get bedrooms in a, in a basement level, um, you can sort of have all that extra space without it counting against your FAR limit uh, that the city provides uh, based on the, the square footage of the lot. And so we started looking at that and can we get, and then can we get cars down and cut in on a, on a level and maybe even use that as part of the basement um, so that we're sort of creating a garage and using that one to provide our on-site parking that's required by the city uh, without sort of cutting into uh, the regulations as they stand because you get exemptions for garages, uh, a 200 square foot exemption up to uh, 400, um, depending on uh, if there's habitable space above or not. But if it's considered a basement, then it doesn't matter if there's habitable space above. Uh, the trouble with using a basement that we saw right off the bat is it's really designed for a lot that slopes down and away from the street, not a lot that slopes up and away from the street. Like walk, classic walkout. Yeah. Right and so you can, you can walk out on the back of your lot if you're, you know, but your house is sort of uh, at, a, at a sort of normal residential scale on the front. Uh, we had the opposite of that. Our, our lot was sort of steeply sloping up from the street. So really it's sort of a, a new idea for us is can we sort of create that, that idea of walkout basement? On the front of the lot. Yeah. Um, and with this narrow lot and, and sloping, we, we had very limited options in terms of putting a, 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 a long driveway and having a, a separated garage at the back of the house just was not feasible on this site. Yeah. And, and we would have had to, you know, we'd have one of those driveways that's like you immediately come up the street and go up a 30% grade um, to try to get into a garage, which was, you know, not something uh, we wanted to do from a design standpoint and not something the client wanted from just a program and utility standpoint. So these two diagrams here were two, we were just early on exploring different ways of getting kind of parking into the site, cut in driveway, and then, and then parking uh, two different arrangements. And then maybe Troy talk about you know, some of the, the, on the plan arrangement on the, on the main floor kind of our first instincts here. Yeah, and so our, our first thoughts, is, you know, the client came in, sort of did programming and sort of the sort of base level of uh, putting sort of the public spaces on the front of the lot and as they get private, sort of as we move to the back of the lot, having the sort of main bedroom suite. Uh, and given sort of the rules and restrictions and, and heights related to how you can create a basement because there's, there's a bunch of... Uh, rules that are related to what counts as a basement, how 
how far it needs to be below, how much of the surface area of the basement needs to be below grade, uh, which sort of set what the finished floor level could be of our main of the main level, which is sort of that middle sketch you're seeing in both of these options here. And I think if I if I remember correctly, the rule is the, the main level can only be a maximum of three feet above uh, natural grade um, mm -hmm. at the front building line, which is again yeah. very challenging when the when you're trying to get a basement on a an uphill sloping site. Exactly. And so what we were finding from these schemes was that uh, that the back of the house with this, you know, kind of our clients wanted a fairly level house, not a bunch of steps in it. Uh, we were pretty much giving away the whole back of the house. Yeah, because basically to get the floor level we needed, the house really ended up sort of bunkered in on the back of the house. So access to the, the exterior, which was part of the program is the client really wanted um, sort of a house that even on this narrow lot sort of existed with sort of interior and exterior living spaces that flowed together. Um, and so these diagrams we took to the city and sat down and uh, want to move forward, uh, sort of learn some things that were allowable on this lot that we didn't get in our research. Um, we're in the urban watershed and typically the city of Austin has a, a four foot cut and fill rule. So you can cut four feet, you can fill four feet and that's your, your maximum, your allowable, that's allowable anywhere on the lot. Um, in, in an urban watershed, there is no cut and fill limitation, which is something we had worried about with the idea of, of doing, of going down to do the parking because we didn't know if we could cut enough to get the driveway down. And so once we heard this, we're like, that's perfect. We can cut our driveway, we can get down to the level we wanna to get to so that we can create this walkout basement on the front of the house. The other thing it allowed us to do was as we went to the back of the house, we could, cut in a yard. And one of the things that allowed us to do all this was that our client is a concrete contractor and basically said, I've got the equipment to dig, um, so don't hold back. We can, we can earth move and make these things happen and don't let that sort of any worries about cutting uh, dictate the design because they can do retaining walls and, uh, and do all the cutting we needed to do. He said that before he realized how hard all that <laughs> limestone was in the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is pretty handy having a, um, a client who's a concrete contractor. I'd definitely say that. Um, and the, the second thing we found is during this time, the clients were sort of just going out and it was, a, it was a vacant lot at the time, but they would just go out there on the weekends and hang out and see how they used the lot. And the thing they found out is the place they gravitated to because it just felt more private and interesting when they were at home was the back of the lot. And so given- There's a nice tree here, a huge tree on the neighbor's lot and a smaller tree on their lot. It's shady here. You felt a little bit more protected and away from the big house to the north and even the house to the south. So yeah, they were really communicating to us that that back part of the lot was the, the special place to be. And then that, and, and the way the house sits where you're really having to come up about nine feet from the street to get in the main portion of the house really meant that, uh, or just sort of come in the entry that that uh, main bedroom wing as we shifted it to the front of the house uh, was really sort of private in its, its uh, you know, engagement with the street because it was so high above uh, uh, the street level. So it's kind of this backwards arrangement where you, you come in, you bypass, the master and then get uh, you know deep into the heart of the house with the with the outdoors the, I'm sorry the public spaces and the outdoor spaces being at the back uh, the private spaces bedroom wing in the, in the front that was kind of a, one of the big the big shift that we made at this level of the design um, and then sort of as we started to look and how do we start to make sort of larger spaces that get the kind of square footage we need so sort of as we start, start to go up in scale. And we came up with this idea of sort of orienting sort of the, the building to the, to the property, the tapering property lines, um, and sort of taking those two lines and just offsetting them and seeing what the resultant space was of the overall plan, um, where you can see here that there's 
the sort of north property line, we're parallel to it. And as we drop down to the south side, um, we start to sort of step back, but always keeping that relationship to the property line, which gave us more uh, yard to access uh, as we sort of the living spaces moved up the hill. Um, also got us farther away from the, the critical root center, this you know, one pristine oak tree that they had on their, on their property. You can see the critical root zones just barely dashed in here, these trees. We were really, really tied in between those two trees. Mm -hmm. And um, another one in the front is just ginormous. And then, you know, we were also sort of playing with ideas of how do you create a front porch and, and going back to the idea of scale of this building. And so moving the, the main bedroom wing and the sort of entry access porch that the, that the cursor is on right now um, allowed us to sort of move a smaller mass to sort of the front, towards the front of the property uh, and engage the street and move the sort of larger two and three story elements to the core of the property so that they didn't uh, uh, sort of, it wasn't such this ominous thing sort of sitting at the street front. Never presents as a, as a whole facade. Yeah. It, there's even, if you're, if you're driving up uh, the street from the south, um, you almost pass the house before you even know it's there. I, I drive past about half the time I'm going there. <laughs> um, and so this started to sort of segue into how are we going to mask this thing with these uh, tapering walls and uh, led us to sort of the next plan, which is really uh, what the final plan ended up being. And so we ended up with these walls parallel to the two tapering property lines. And how do we start regularizing, regularizing the interior of these spaces? And what we, what we realized is once we got back into the kitchen, dining, living and then out to the outdoor living spaces was by taking the, the transverse walls across that space and making them uh, sort of perpendicular to the bisecting angle. Uh, even though these rooms weren't square, giving them that trapezoidal shape gave them some sort of uh, uniformity uh, and that we sort of picked up in, in the detailing of the house. And of course, at this point too, we're starting to get deep into massing studies, three-dimensional in our software and, and having a, an idea of, of how the shapes of the house are coming together. I can tell you that there's probably a lot of cursing of the architects with the framers and the, and the foundation people having to execute all these, uh, all these angles on site. But as you'll see when you come out and visit the site, um, over, what is it, two weeks from now, um, it really makes for some pretty special spaces. And uh, I'll point out one of the things that I really like about this development of the house that is it really, again, on this, on this fairly tight urban site, it really sets up these long axes, these long vistas where you, when you come up on that front porch, you think you're kind of coming up to a bungalow and you'll, it'll be more clear when we show the photographs, but you come out of the front door and when that door opens, you're, you're seeing you know, 120 feet to, you know, through the house and back. Uh, and then also when you're in the main bedroom, um, you feel very private because you've kind of stepped away from that main pathway. But again, it has these long views down the site that are very private and looking back to the bedroom, you're really just looking through the corner of it. And, um, you're not, your privacy is not really compromised. Anything else to talk about on this? Kind of, kind of, kind of move on. Yeah, and so this sort of diagram, which is really the, the sort of uh, site plan and, and sort of regulations page from our permit set starts to show all of the sort of elements that we were dealing with in terms of the city and how we were using those to get sort of more FAR than we're allotted uh, because we're, we're using tools to get sort of free FAR um, as, it, as it were uh, to sort of make the house work within those regulations. And so if we sort of look at the front, uh, one thing we learned again in going to the city is that we can have a front porch that extends five feet into the setback. And by extending that into the setback um, and looking at subchapter F, which is a series of rules and regulations that govern most of the sort of uh, neighborhood yeah. urban lots in Austin and where they can be massed, how tall they can be. It's a very sort of complicated set of rules that set up tents, um, but they set up. And so 
by having that porch that comes out to here, it sets up our building line. And anyone who's who's dealt with the, the subchapter F10 knows that basically as the as the tent goes back along the lot, it's in 40 foot sections that begin again sort of every 40 feet. And then you create this sort of tent that has sort of a, a gabled truncated uh, shape that you really have to put your building within with a few rules that allow you to poke out in different areas. And we'll, get, we'll get into some of those uh, when we look at some diagrams in a minute. But pulling that forward allowed us to pull the tent forward and the height of the tent is set by the points along where they intersect the property line. And so by doing that, it allowed our tent to get slightly higher, um, which really helped us in having uh, incorporating a basement level and really have an intersection of the house that's three stories tall, uh, and and but still allowing us to stay under that tent. Um, and then uh, it kind of shows all some of the some of the other kind of nitty gritty like this this little it's probably hard to see on your screens, but this is our little uh, calculations unfolding all the walls of the basement to sort of prove up that the amount of uh, basement walls were uh, you know, more than 50% um, underground. Uh, Below what existing grade was uh, at the time of the, of the survey of the property. Um, you know, again, we're site plans or where the rotor reads the road on all this nitty gritty stuff. We're, we're detailing out the impervious cover. I think our impervious cover was like 44.99%. We were Absolutely maxing that out. One thing though, that the vertical stacking of this house that we were able to get with the basement um, really had our, our footprint of the house much smaller than was, what was allowed, which was something that I think really gave over more square footage to the, the landscaping and allowed this really lovely outdoor space to, to happen out uh, behind the building. Mm -hmm. And then also just the, another thing that sort of affects houses in Austin, Right now is is uh, visibility visibility requirements, which um, is is about accessibility to the house and how you do that. Because of our steeply sloping house, we got what's called a switchback waiver. So if you're going to have to do a ramp that needs a switchback, um, basically we're, you're allowed to only meet certain parts of that requirement. Um, and so once we got that switchback waiver. We still kept the visibility for the main level and the, the parking entry level so that uh, we have a, a sort of no step threshold uh, at both entry doors and an access uh, way to get to the bathroom on both of those levels. Good and advanced into here. And then this is sort of looking at the house in three dimensions and it's probably again, hard to see on here because the, the lines are a little light, but sort of laying out where the tent is in relation to the structure. Uh, and really starting, you can start to see uh, in the sort of elevation one, uh, the sort of the way the massing of the house set up, that sort of smaller gable at the front with the uh, sort of saddlebag porch that really pushes, you know, a good, you know, 20 feet in front of the larger elevation of the three-story mass beyond, which starts to break it down into a human scale. Particularly when you think about, you can sort of see that heavily shaded area, which is really um, cutting through the ground that we're going up. So when you're looking at the front of the house and the, the sort of main bedroom wing, it really feels like a two-story building until you sort of look down the driveway uh, and, and see the sort of lower level and into the carport. And from the street, it really even feels like a one-story building. You can sort of see it here, you know, streets down here, but one-story building, uh, perceptually pulling forward towards the house and perceptually a two-story building um, sitting on, on top of the ground. But in, in reality, it's a three-story building, just well hidden. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, th this little diagram complete, uh, totally stole this from, uh, from, from Murray Legg. We love those little diagrams that he does on his website. So we're just going to race through this to show you kind of, again, sloping site wider at the street and narrower at the back and, and sloping, I think it was 15, 17 feet, something like that mm -hmm. from, from the street level up to the back. Um, but, you know, 
dug into the house to get that extra square footage. And uh, again, like Troy was saying, that, that uh, unlimited cut and fill allowed us to get the driveway cut in uh, in order to make that happen. That urban watershed, if we hadn't had that, the scheme would not have been feasible without a variance. Uh, as Troy also mentioned, we were able to use that cut and fill to, to cut into the back portion of the site to get um, uh, spaces for both uh, living, you know, interior living areas and also the yard. Yeah, and that came from the idea that the clients didn't want a significant amount of sort of level change as we were on that main level. We did end up having a few steps between sort of the, the vertical circulation core in the main bedroom and the living spaces are up about a foot from that as we step up the site, but it's a very limited sort of, of level change that the client was okay with. As long as we're digging, we might as well dig a pool. Uh, so again, problem with this tapering site, you can't just put a big dumb box on there. It's, it's you know, whatever width you might want for rooms, it hangs over the site. So obviously we, uh, as Troy talked about, we, we took a, a tapered approach uh, to get the spaces. Uh, started delineating the massing to bring this one story uh, element forward to get that, that kind of more bungalow scale and then also started pulling spaces towards the back. Uh, single story spaces. Again, the, the, the areas that you engage that the house outdoors in the front and the back, it really does feel like a one story house. Yeah, and so it has a more human scale for those places where you're really existing up against the building. Yeah. Uh, this is showing that McMansion tent that Troy was talking about and how you know, it kind of forces us to, to diminish the, the scale of the building as you go up. And so uh, you know, that influenced the the kind of roofscape of the building. Uh, also, uh, our clients and we, in fact, wanted to fit into that historical, uh, more sort of bungalow, not Game just mold. scale, but just like you know, you know, perception of the building. So having these, these, these sort of friendly gables face the street is important. Uh, there's uh, some allowances uh, from that, uh, from the McMansion tent that allows you to have dormers that, that interrupt that tent and we took advantage of those so that we could get some head height in some of those rooms upstairs. Uh, and then again, taking advantage of the fact that on porches, outdoor porches don't count towards FAR. So we're bringing this, uh, this entry porch in uh, both from an experiential standpoint and also uh, sort of uh, you know, practical getting, getting to the street and also bringing some porches onto the back of the property and side of the property in order to be able to step out of the building and enjoy the landscape. Um, adding some, some detail uh, in the, the finished product. Again, shout out to Murray. Thanks for letting us steal your idea. And also uh, shout out to uh, Maggie Edwards, who's our summer intern, that uh, put those little diagrams together. All right, so now we're going to dive into the, kind of the plans and start showing some pictures. Um, Troy, you want to walk us through that? Yeah, so you, this is sort of coming off the street down the driveway, um, uh, sort of turning into what became a carport. And this is sort of the, the client's sort of daily entry into the home. So, uh, and you'll see in the, in the photographs on the next page, really trying to show the expose some of the structure so that it doesn't feel like you're driving into this bunker uh, of concrete, but there's some detail and that's in, in sort of creating this, uh, a, you know, an in, a, a nice entry for them on a day-to-day -day basis when they're not going up sort of the stairs and the porch and coming in through the, the front door the way a guest would. And then uh, taking advantage of the basement area to get a sort of fourth bedroom office space as well as a bathroom. And then it also allowed us uh, plenty of space for our, our mechanical and some, some storage that in a, in a house of this scale was, was definitely needed given how tight some of the spaces were on the upper level and, and trying to uh, have generous spaces on the, the main sort of living areas as well. And, this sort of stair core that runs up the full three stories of the house. We sort of put it on the front of the house to sort of be this element that really, uh, it can be a focal point from the street, but adds interest to that sort of large facade. Sort of like as a lantern, and this is not a space you're hanging out in, you're just moving through, so it, uh, 
So, okay, they just make it very glassy. And this sort of really shows as you sort of come in and, and come into this carport, uh, some of the detailing of seeing the, the, the structure and the, and the woodwork above at the sort of porch space. Um, and as you come into this sort of stair hall uh, with a, a wine room and this sort of really nice way to sort of come home every day. And, and even though you're coming in on the basement level, it's, it has the same processional feel. Uh, as if you were coming into the front door on the exterior. And this photo sort of shows the idea of sort of really using that sort of walkway that's connecting us over the top of the carport to really get us to the stairs coming up from the street, but doing it at a scale that it really feels like a front porch as well and can be inhabited uh, in the way that the sort of historic nature of this neighborhood where you have these small bungalows with front porches where people would sit and talk to their neighbors as they went by, uh, sort of picks up in, in a maybe a little different bent on, on that idea. And one thing about like a, sort of starting to showcase, uh, our, again, our client was a concrete contractor. Um, it was okay with, from their minds to show little glimpses of, of concrete. Uh, he did not want to come home after working concrete all day and see a bunch of concrete. But there are a few elements of the house like this, this uh, front wall here where we're starting to showcase their, their beautiful architectural concrete. Um, the front of the house, this is a great shot to get you a sense of the scale. There's that little uh, one-story bungalow to the south of the lot and what you can't see is on higher ground uh, to the north side, to the left of this photo, there's uh, higher ground so it already feels tall. And then it's really just this two-story wall of a, of a large newer building uh, that we're, we're uh, really trying to turn our backs on with the, most of the house. Um, this is a great place to uh, shout out to uh, uh, Jose from Austin Outdoor Design. They did a great job integrating uh, beautiful landscaping uh, and also the structure the stair uh, um, cantilevers over the roots of the critical root zone of this tree, uh, engineered by Sam at Fort Structures, but uh, um, really did a great job of what it was a big challenge of getting uh, up a lot of stairs up to that up to that level. And uh, when we're talking about that basement, this is the level right here. Um, this main floor level could only be three feet above the existing natural grade. Uh, for all of this down here to count as basement. So that was one of the really big challenges of the site is balancing out how deep we could cut this and how low we could push all this in order to get that credit. If this had gone up literally literally two more inches, um, the, the basement would not have counted as a basement. Uh, and I also want one more thing. You, so as you're walking up this front porch, and, and you, you get a sense of these, these long vistas uh, that you get. It's a little bit hard of a night shot, but you're really seeing from this point all the way through the house back to the, the fireplace on the outdoor room in the pool. And there's our colleague, Drew. Hey, Drew. Um, main level of the house, you want to walk them through that? Yeah, so uh, if you're, if you're sort of, the stairs got cut off, um, but sort of come up that stair that we just looked at in the previous photo, uh, this, uh, sort of covered porch on the front of the house and the main entry into the entry level, which puts you on the sort of vertical corridor as you come up. So where you arrive coming home as, as the owner, or where you arrive as a guest, sort of puts you in this sort of hallway. Uh, the idea sort of, uh, one of the ideas of this is, is really, is this sort of main bedroom suite sits on the front of the lot is, is guests come in really tucking in the door and hiding it. And as you have the view we discussed in the previous slide, you're really sort of drawn in, you know, to the sort of larger public spaces and back to the back of the lot. So you just kind of bypass the sort of the private space. Um, and then, you know, incorporating uh, so, sort of through detailing, I think we talked about trying to regularize these spaces uh, given that they have these uh, tapering walls on either side and which could be, wasn't like we said, we were trying to sort of uh, play into 
the sort of original context of this neighborhood. And so how do you take something that has these really strange geometries and try to regularize it? And we did that uh, one by uh, sort of creating a sort of massive floor on that sort of two and three story element. And then really viewing some of the living room and the outdoor room uh, as sort of saddlebags and even a, the sort of a window bay off the dining space as a saddlebag. Probably shows that better in this in this uh, photograph here. So this everything that's rendered in sheetrock here is part of that that core Troy was talking about. And then these spaces that saddlebag offer there. Here's the dining room bay. Uh, and as we will show you in the next slide, the, the, the living room bay, feel like you're stepping outside of that core. So even uh, even though you can't see the second floor above you, you're sort of perceiving it and perceiving the weight of it. Uh, and then the other thing I think Troy did a fantastic job in this house is using these these kind of I'll call them the poche walls to to regularize that that those geometries and have the the the, the more uh, utility service areas um, cut into the house and, and the spaces that people live pull out of the house. Mm -hmm. Kind of playing with that. Uh, uh, this is looking back uh, towards the towards the living room. Yeah. So if we're sort of standing in the kitchen, you can see on the sort of uh, upper right shot, sort of inside that mass of the kitchen and dining room, sort of looking back to this lower pavilion space. And the idea that these, these tapering walls, uh, one, we wanted for when you're outside the house, we wanted to keep the, the, uh, the top of wall or the plate sort of uh, even as you go along the outside of the house. And that meant the ridge, because of the geometry of it, would pitch uh, sort of down towards the back. So it creates this, particularly as you're looking along this long axis of the house, it creates this sort of forced perspective and even reinforces it more um, and draws your view towards it, this sort of end point. It makes the spaces feel larger, even though they're scaled to be these cozy spaces to, you know, you know just really. And, and then further accentuating that by trying to sort of dematerialize the, the wall between the interior living room and the exterior living room. And this goes back to uh, the steel doors from Presidio windows and doors and fort structures sort of creating a sort of minimal steel structure that then we could come in with steel windows and really have this sort of wall that's uh, uh, very transparent and, and you can flow through. Yeah, I'm gonna go back and shot because this is a great, again, working with Blair Burton interior, I think she did a phenomenal job of like sort of picking out um, these sensuous materials that go great with our architecture and, and, the, um, and all the furnishings just feel so comfortable. And beautiful, and also those gorgeous uh, hardwood floors that Christina did. Uh, and then these, uh, you know, again, these are more of those Presidio doors. Um, all the they, Presidio also supplied the wood windows in the house, which were um, Sierra Pacific windows, um, turned out great as well. But wanted to feature these steel windows in the in the main floor. Um, I'm just checking in on time. We should probably wrap it up pretty soon. One of the things I, I think really successful the the north wall again, sort of bunkered in, and the north neighbor uh, being above us. Uh, we wanted to have these windows, high windows that balanced out the light, but I think it does a really good job of letting in the light and balancing it out without exposing yourself to that neighbor. And then as we sort of move out to the outdoor room and the pool uh, and, the, and the sort of layout and Austin out, outdoor design did a great job of sort of taking this sort of concrete wall that exists along the back and it just tracks into uh, the retaining wall for the outdoors and the pool. And, you know, again, adding to this sort of feel that this whole back area is sort of a courtyard where you're, you know, you're sitting six feet below grade on that north side and then you have your privacy fence. So you really, your neighbors, even though they're uphill from you, are almost invisible. Yeah, this, this line right about here is where the natural grade was and we're, we're really mm -hmm. dug in. You can see these trees are basically planted in natural grade. I want to go back to slide two because I, one person I want to really call out, Boomtown Design, touched so many parts of this house, all the tricky trim around the stairwell, uh, all this beautiful trim work and, and making, there's just 
probably hardly any space in this house they didn't touch. And, and they, I, I thought they did a really fantastic job making this um, this house sing. Uh, and all those all the wood, of course, supplied by uh, East Side Lumber. It's all Douglas fir, and then the beams out there are, are pine, uh, sort of stained out to look like the fir. Um, and then uh, again, it's great having this uh, a, a concrete contractor as a uh, as a client. They can pull off these really um, tight, high end uh, architectural finishes, and then and super challenging to integrate that in with the with the house and the pool as well. And then I think this sort of middle photo uh, at the top really shows you sort of as you look back and where this house sort of even not in that main space from the main bedroom and the, the dining room sort of is not just looking to the south to get light, but also looking back and giving you this long view across the sort of landscaped area of the property. And it's the dining room bay there and then that's the, the window into the main bedroom right there. So good to segue to the main bedroom. Joy, you want to talk about this cool door? Yeah, and so uh, one of the things when we talked about sort of trying to get guests to sort of slide by that main bedroom space was this niche. And we sort of came up with this idea of this sort of wood door that not only from the bedroom side, but from the exterior side, other than the, the door handle, really just reads as a, as a wood panel wall um, to sort of further sort of uh, make it invisible. To, to people sort of coming into the house. Um, the, the middle photo shows the sort of main bedroom, again, looking back across the lot um, and down the, the length of it as opposed to, to the south um, so that you're not always just staring at your neighbor. And then it also shows if you look at the ceiling, sort of where the upper level sort of comes in and how the integration of the sort of uh, smaller mass, we sort of use that to create uh, some uh, delineation in the ceiling so it didn't just feel like you were in this sort of nine foot plate room that once you're out of the sort of bed chamber, the ceiling could pop up. Um, and in this, this bathroom, again, is facing back towards the street, but you're, you're far enough elevated above the street level where it's quite private. I was over there the other day and, and uh, Mark and Rosemary said that the, they were talking to their neighbor and the neighbor didn't even realize this was their main bedroom, uh, you know, bathtub. <laughs> they, they, they thought it was a study or something. Uh, again, these uh, beautiful fixtures uh, supplied by, uh, by Ferguson, um, spec by Blair Burton. Um, anything else to talk about here? This is the upstairs. So kind of come up to the top of this stair tower and you're in this uh, really what feels like up in the eaves, uh, funky ceilings that take up the shape of the roof. Uh, this is this cozy little den at the top of the stairs and then uh, two bedrooms for their grown yeah. kids. And, and even though we weren't taking advantage of the sort of attic exemptions for FAR, which also gets you sort of, uh, you can have spaces that FAR doesn't count get against. We, we didn't use those, but we wanted that feel and also uh, of sort of lower plates and, and living inside sort of vaulted ceilings. It also sort of allowed us to keep the massing of that sort of larger two and three story section a little bit smaller um, and, and have the feel that it wasn't this sort of huge three story uh, element. And those rooms are very expressive. So I think this is our last slide. This is the you know, section through the building. Uh, really sort of encapsulates all the stuff we're talking about. The sloping site, you know, low at the street and you know, high, you know, 15 feet of rise across the property. How we're using this basement uh, tool that the city of Austin allows to get extra square footage, get the, the, get the parking out of sight and under cover um, without it uh, killing you on FAR, getting extra square footage. Uh, having a uh, main level, there's those two stairs that Troy was alluding to, main level that's very friendly um, from the front door all the way to the back of the house, only, only two steps in that whole arrangement uh, with such a steeply soaking site and having these outdoor spaces that really feel private but connected to the outside. And you can see some of the numbers at the top um, where we have 
you know, our allowable FAR for this project was 2856. And what we ended up with uh, in, in square footage of condition space was 4,000 square feet and under roof, um, just over 4,600. So, you know, getting a, 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 for the size lot that it is, a very large house, but ideally that doesn't um, read as a sort of massive house and takes a little bit uh, more from the character of the neighborhood. What we like to call uh, 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound sack. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's the end of our presentation. And um, we'll see if any questions came in. Christy, we welcome you back. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Excellent work. That was fascinating. And it checked a lot of the like nerd boxes for me about <laughs> you know, the form making components of the site. Um, it looks like y'all really worked with so many what we would call design opportunities, right? Um, which are limitations and problems. And um, the result is gorgeous. So um, we have a couple of comments and questions. Um, first from Eric. And guys, we still have a little bit of time. If y'all want to put anything in the Q&A section, we'll be sure to address it um, before we run out of time. But Eric Rouser, um, an architect and, and builder um, who you might know as former AIA president of Wine and Cheese, um, he wanted to make sure that we gave a shout out to Mark Whaling uh, for being a longtime supporter of AIA Austin, and especially when he is sitting on our finance committee. If you've ever sat on a finance committee, you know there is no greater sacrifice. So thank you, Mark Whaling. Um, can you talk about the extra care and cost associated with so much excavation and below grade construction? Um, that's the question on the table. Yeah, and I will I will uh, second Eric's shout out to Mark. He, uh, the kind of interesting story of, of this house, um, when I served on the board of AA Austin, I think it may have even been President Mark, um, you know, as owner of Austin Concrete Development, was one of our very longtime supportive uh, um, allied members, and he was on the board. That's how I met Mark. So the whole reason that we're designing this house for these clients is because of AI Austin, so big, big shout out. Go volunteer for AI Austin if you're listening to this, because uh, it, it can lead to jobs, but you're not hanging out with a bunch of architects. Um, and Mark's firm is, is, like I said, one of the few companies that really can deliver on this kind of high-end um, architectural concrete. Uh, in, in terms of the, the extra care and cost um, associated with this excavation, I would not have, wanted to be one of the neighbors in the month that it took them to excavate this. Uh, and I think that if our client hadn't been, um, you know, hadn't owned their own concrete uh, company and had access to kind of at cost excavation, at cost concrete work, it would have been a, a significant burden on the property. So it's, 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 uh, it's tough to show these things that sort of say, sorry, everybody else can't really do this uh, at a reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the numbers uh, were, but um, it, it would have been, you know, probably added $100 a square foot or, or more to, yeah. the, to and the, cost I, of the property. And I know there's some lots in Austin that are just, you know, uh, you know, clay and would be easy to dig out. This one was filled with giant limestone boulders that they, they were hitting. Um, they also, uh, I don't, this was, this was a while back, but there was a lot of rain at the time uh, that's since gone away. Uh, but I know that sort of uh, on a daily basis, those rains were sort of pushing construction um, and causing lots of issues, which were uh, in large part related to, to having to do excavation. Yeah, so it clearly added uh, time and money. Uh, we'd like to think that it, it paid off for our clients. Again, um, they get um, really what I would consider like a suburban sized house on this urban lot, you know? And so um, even though it costs more money, um, even if they were buying this at market rate, I bet you it would, it would, it would, um, it would, it would hold up to the crazy Austin market, um, real estate market. Looks like we got a couple of uh, couple other questions coming in. We do, let's see if we can squeeze in one or two more. Um, did the basement portion use any special energy features since it was concrete in the ground? 
I don't know what you mean by special energy features. So, so like in, in underground construction, it's, uh, it's um, nice from a thermal standpoint and that you're not exposing yourself to, you know, 100 degree outdoor or 18 degree outdoor temperatures. You're, you get to, you know, uh, use the, the earth temperature. I think one of the things that the basement really helped us do um, from a kind of mechanical standpoint was have a pretty sizable mechanical room that um, was able to feed the lower level and the main level from space and not take up valuable real estate um, at grade. Um, so I think, you know, anytime you're underground, you know, I, my mind goes towards waterproofing. And, and, and so there's a lot of care uh, and detailing that happens around that as anybody who's done it knows. Yeah. Um, again, one more reason to hire a good concrete con subcontractor. <laughs> Um, you can tell we're in Austin and everyone's fascinated by basements. I have a, a couple of more questions here related to them. Um, the, the egress windows in the basement bedroom, was that a, a challenge at all? Or was it, was it easy to check that box? It was, it was fairly easy because the way we designed that lower level, um, it could just open up to the, the carport area, which is outside. Um, and under that deck. So we had that ability. Um, we did put a, a window well and a larger uh, window on the, the south side, um, but really just to get light because we had sort of that walkout basement, it made it fairly easy for us in, in this, this particular instance to, to get our egress window in. Um, side note, when we were uh, first designing this house and, and talking to the city of Austin about it, the, the, the rules around basements uh, say that the space has to be um, livable space or, or habitable space, that the only habitable space counts towards basements, um, which we suspected might be a hiccup. So we actually had this um, sort of back pocket design that that, that was gonna be a, a studio instead of a, uh, instead of a carport. And then uh, it was actually permitted as a studio um, and then when we got out there on site with the inspector, we talked talked through that we'd like the option for it to be a carport. Uh, and so it, it, the inspector agreed with us. It didn't change the, the massing or the intent of the McMansion code to have it be a carport, uh, non-habitable space rather than a studio. So mm -hmm. we were able to build it as a carport as, as originally intended. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you, Charles de Piazza, for that question. Kimberly Coolhouse, who says, hi, Philip, wants to know if the Whalings originally requested a 4,000 square foot home with this size lot, or did that final size relate more to what was uncovered that could be allowed with the basement exemption? Um, yeah, I think it, where, it, it, what was the original scope versus where y'all landed? Their, their goal was, you know, they had a program and they knew they want, we were already on a small lot. Um, but they did want that scale of home. You know, I think we were looking at our program. We're like, well, this is a, a 3,200 to, to 3,500 square foot house, um, which obviously even at that point, we didn't have the allowable FAR. So at that point, it was really going to the city and seeing uh, what options we had um, and, and what, what it allowed us. And it allowed us something, you know, larger than that. And so, uh, and that, and they were perfectly fine with that. And once we had already gone down the path of making a basement, we at some point decided to make it larger in order to have that kind of fairly good sized storage and mechanical closet. Um, just it's sort of a pressure relief valve for um, all the stuff of life <laughs> that happens. It was not incrementally that much more expensive just to add that little bit more square feet. And it, again, it kind of regularized the, the structure underneath the upstairs. Uh, building as well. Yeah, and inevitably, you know, you have this sort of large stairwell that now is taking up FAR on three floors instead of two. And, and so uh, it, it allowed us to keep some of the things, the sizes that, that felt right, um, even though we needed that extra space just to get up and down. Mm -hmm. So well, do we have time for more questions or are we out of time? I think we're gonna have to go ahead and call it. This was an amazing presentation. Thank you both so much for taking the time. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks well, come out and see us on the tour. It's a really cool house.
We're happy yeah, to show it I'll off. be there. Thank you so much, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>